You're listening to Romancing in Paris on Paris Underground Radio. Hello, and welcome to the Romancing in Paris podcast. I'm your host, Lily Heisey. In this podcast, we'll be traveling around the city as I pick out my top romantic spots per arrondissement. You don't have to visit these places only as a couple. Exploring them can be the expression of your own love of Paris. Are you ready to get romancing in Paris? Thank you for joining us for this latest episode of A Romancing in Paris. We've done it. We've reached the 10th episode, the end of the season. I hope you've enjoyed this season, which had us traveling from one of the city's most charming secret gardens all the way to the gardens of the Loire Valley and its incredibly romantic castles. Today's episode takes us back to the 11th arrondissement, which, I confess, is likely the least romantic of Paris's 20 districts. That doesn't mean that it is not a great district. Au contraire. It's a fabulous arrondissement for living in, with all of its cool boutiques, coffee shops, cafes, and inventive restaurants. It's just that it doesn't have many romantic treasures. However, I'm saving one of these for the next tour around the arrondissements. And instead, in today's episode, we'll be visiting a site which is similar to the first site we visited in round one of our arrondissement tour. It's likely the most romantic site in the whole arrondissement. Plus, it's a site which is very intrinsically linked to the history of the 11th. Grab your chéri, we're going to the Cour des Mois. Regular listeners might recall the site we previously visited in the 11th, the Passage Lhomme. In that episode, we learned how the 11th was rather working class and an industrial part of the city, and how it became a hub for artisanal workshops. These aspects were linked to the history of that particular passageway, while the Cour de Mois history is somewhat different. And we'll delve into this during this episode. The passageways of eastern Paris, those in the 11th and 12th arrondissement, are generally open air, instead of the covered ones found around the opera district. The 11th has a great concentration of these cobbled, most pedestrian passageways, and the vine-laden, tranquil Cour de Mois is probably the prettiest of them all. I didn't choose it for the first round because I felt the Passage Lum was more true to the roots of the 11th. That said, I think you're going to love this enchanting, postcard-perfect passageway. Its location is key to its history, but also to its magic. Arriving in busy Place de la Bastille, one is instantly pulled into its turbine of hustle and bustle. People going to the opera house. Evening revelers on their way to the rowdy bars on Rue de Lap, and those on and around Rue de la Roquette. Others going to the twice-weekly Bastille Market. Food trolleys toting behind them. The round square is rarely peaceful. However, nestled behind is this tranquil oasis that is the Cour d'Amois. This is a very historically significant location in Paris. Most listeners will know of the formidable Bastille Fortress, which once stood on this spot. Yet, they might not know of its origins, which are somewhat connected to the history of our laneway. (music) 
In 1356, Etienne Marcel, the provost of the merchants of Paris, whom we've discussed on episodes of this and my other podcast, Paris Cachet, began building a moat a few hundred feet beyond the existing late 12th century Philippe Auguste Wall. This project was then developed as a full-fledged city wall, as of 1358, by King Charles V, a wall which would expand the size of Paris, but only on the right bank. It hugged the city from south of La Bastille to just be on the Louvre, where the carousel archway stands. The Charles V wall was gradually torn down in the mid-1600s, when it was replaced by the larger Louis XIII wall, and the area where the wall stood was converted into Le Grand Boulevard, a continuous series of wide streets which still exist today. However, because of this, very little of the Charles V wall still stands today, even in little bits, whereas there are, oddly enough, and miraculously, more stretches of the earlier Philippe Auguste Wall. One of the few remnants of the Charles V Wall were unearthed when the Carousel de Louvre shopping mall was constructed in the late 1980s, during the big works done at the Louvre, which included the shiny glass pyramid, which is now the entrance to the museum. But, back to the other side of the wall. The Bastille Fortress was constructed to guard the eastern edge of the Charles V Wall. At the time, the king was living in the Hotel St. Paul Castle Complex, which was situated just inside Paris and just outside the Philippe Auguste Wall, and so the Bastille was built in its proximity and it assisted in protecting the royals against possible invasion or other internal threats. The wall was surrounded by a moat. This was almost 13 meters wide and 4 meters deep, and it was filled with water from the Seine River. Only six gates granted access into the city. Two of these, the Port Saint-Denis and the Port Saint-Martin, are discussed in episode 2 of Paris Cachet. Over here, on its eastern edge, next to the Bastille, was the Saint-Antoine Gate. Right at the beginning of the Rue Saint-Antoine, the street which still heads west from Place de la Bastille, demolished in the aftermath of the famous storming of the Bastille on July 14th, the event which sparked the First French Revolution, if you come to Place de la Bastille, you can now imagine where the fortress stood, on the western side of the current square, and in front of and just south of Rue Saint-Antoine. If you're disappointed about not seeing any of the fortress still in the square, you can always go underground, as traces of its foundations were discovered down on the metro, on the platform of Metro Line 5. You might be wondering what all of this has to do with La Cour d'Amois. Well, the charming lane was built atop a creek which was used as a sewer that emptied into the moat of the Charles V wall at the bastion of Saint-Antoine, next to the gate of Saint-Antoine. The lane's path traces where this bastion was. So, one could say that the Cour d'Amois has foundations dating back over 650 years, in a tiny way. The current lane was created in 1780 by a certain Antoine Pierre d'Amois, who of course gave the lane its name. A hardware dealer by trade, Damois' lane became mostly occupied by rag pickers and scrap metal workers from the Auvergne region of central France. So, 
less glamorous than the furniture makers and other craftsmen who were found in the passageways on either side of Rue du Faubourg Saint Antoine. In World War I, tanks were repaired here on the lane, I suppose because it also headed east towards the front. Then, butcher shops and cafes still owned by Auvergnat lined the lane. There is, in fact, one ancient establishment that is still left on the street, which we'll get around to when we pop down the lane. Other than that, it's hard to imagine that a sewer once flowed here, and a noisy metalworks, gruesome butchers. Well, let's put our imagination to work by visiting the passageway ourselves. Arriving on the north side of Place de la Bastille, between Boulevard Richard Lenoir and Rue de la Roquette, you might at first have some trouble locating the entrance to the lane amidst the bright cafes which crowd into this stretch of the square. But there, at number 12, Place de la Bastille, is a small entrance once you step through you'll certainly get some ohs and ahs and oh la las from your sherry. It's like you've entered another world, or another time, perhaps Paris in the 1780s? Soon after entering the lane, look out for a little niche, where there is a fountain and a statue of the Virgin Mary, a good omen for your little romantic jaunt. As you slowly amble down the lane, with your chéri, you'll see that the butcher shops and metal workshops have now been replaced by art galleries and design studios, covered in vines and decorated with potted plants and shrubs. You might start to catch a pleasant aroma wafting through the air. No, not that of flowers, but instead of coffee. The lane is home to the Atelier de Torification, one of Paris's oldest coffee roasters, opened all the way back after World War II in 1946. Duck inside to marvel at the roasters' bright red canisters containing their various beans. You can pick up some to make coffee at home, or get a brew to sip on at one of the handful of outdoor tables which are in front of the shop. Here you can further take in the wonderful ambiance of the lane, or else you can also get a takeaway coffee to accompany you on your onward wanderings around the area. One note of caution, the shop is closed on Sundays, as is the lane on Sunday mornings. If you're enjoying this episode of Romancing in Paris, you may also like to tune in to our sister podcast, The Terroir Podcast, which explores French gastronomy. Romancing in Paris will be right back after a word from our sponsors. And now, back to Romancing in Paris. Once you've reached the end of the bewitching passageway, why not carry on your stroll in the nearby areas of the 11th by discovering the Passage Lum from the previous podcast on the district, which I've mentioned at the beginning of the podcast. It's about a coffee drink away from the Cour de Moi and offers a fascinating contrast to it. You might also like to take an amble up the lovely and local Rue de la Roquette, buzzing with its cafes, bars, and restaurants. A short block away is also the enclave of the Café de l'Industrie, with two cafés and a wine bar. The very Parisian venues serve good French classics and are popular with the locals of the Bastille area. Alternatively, look up who's the next hottest chef in the 11th, and book a table at the restaurant to finish off your romancing in the district. 
Thank you for joining me for this episode of Romancing in Paris. We'll be taking a little break from the podcast, but fear not, we'll be back in a few months' time, skipping season four of Paris Underground Radio, but back for season five. You can use this time to catch up on some back episodes you might have missed, or discover some of the other great podcasts on the network. You can also peruse my website, jetemmeneither.com, home to a wide range of great articles on unique romantic things to do in Paris and beyond. Feel free to drop me a line if you have any suggestions for the next seasons. Until we meet again, happy romancing in Paris. This episode of Romancing in Paris was produced by Jennifer Garrity for Paris Underground Radio. For more on this show and shows like it, please visit parisundergroundradio.com.